Hello there, person of interest. I'm not saying you're a criminal, I'm just saying that right now you're a person of interest to me. Or perhaps even an interesting person. Anyways, uh, the usual bitch fest is about to ensue. So, you know, this is just kind of like the way I try to work through things because things haven't been going my way for a long time. So, you know, um, I have a friend that says uh, better out than in. And since I don't really have uh, very many people who would be willing to listen to me complain, no matter how entertaining I might be, uh, it's an option. So, uh, the news, let's see, from the last time, is I do have an actual date to look forward to for getting rid of the uh, uh, drug addicts slash squatters that have been like, making my life miserable for about three months and I won't go through the backstory again but except for in this manner which is to say the there's four apartments in the building one of the apartments went from drug depot because they were cooking meth across the street and selling it out of the apartment upstairs to a flop house when the guy got thrown in jail and the rent was still being paid to a squatter's paradise so that's what I've been living with. Drug dealing, flop house, where literally the door is left open. Not even like unlocked, just open. Anybody can go in there. Any street person, whoever, can go up there and, uh, you know, crash out, shoot up, whatever they want to do. That went on for a few weeks in the middle of this ordeal. It's been going on for three months, but I do have a set out date where... Like I told my landlord, I tried a machete. A machete ain't going to get it done. You need somebody here with a gun and the authority to use it. So he finally hired the bailiff after putting that off like he's put out off everything concerning this. But the bailiff is going to come August 31st and throw my enemies out of here. And they are my enemies because, uh, you know, I've had death threats and uh, there's hostility back and forth. Because I just... I just was the only person that seemed concerned that there was people living in the house that I knew were tied to the meth house across the street that nobody knew even what their names were. So that brings me to the new tenant because my landlord apparently people are always telling me that all he cares about is the money and I'm like oh he's a, he seems like a nice guy he doesn't seem like that and all but you know they haven't got the squatters out of here yet and there's somebody moved in there on Sunday night I didn't know it so Sunday night I'm having my usual miserable day I have these days it's about a little bit after 9 9 p.m. and Sunday night water starts coming through my ceiling and I'm like holy shit there's nobody that lives above me I'm like what's going on here I'm pretty maybe the squatters like decide we're gonna leave anyway or maybe they got informed that they had a set out date where the uh, bailiff was going to come and throw them out and throw all their shit on the road. So maybe they just turned on the faucets and they left as a joke. You know, because they're criminals. They're getting booted out of this place. They hate everybody in this building. So, you know, I'm having all these crazy thoughts and stuff and water's coming through the ceiling and um, I text the landlord and tell him about it and I said, I thought there was... I'm freaked out. I said, I don't know if it's the pipes or what or if the, what's going on. And he informs me that he gave the keys to somebody on Friday. And now he never told me that people moved in upstairs. So I didn't even know it, you know. They were, I just heard walking around, but I hear so much walking around from the squatters that it's just, I lumped it in with that. So anyways, I'm like, oh, great. I mean, they literally got the keys on Friday, but I don't think they've been here much. So I think Sunday was the first day they moved any stuff in here and, immediately they're being uh, irresponsible and overflowing something and you know I got holes and watermarks all through my ceiling I guess I could show you I could try anyway I can't see what I'm pointing the camera at but in this little slice of hell that I occupy um yeah it's not sure maybe I, there we go let's put a little light on it maybe that'll help no well, in the far corner there, where it's a little bit darker, there's a panel missing because that fell in one time. You can't see all the watermarks. 
Um, maybe you can see there's a hole. If the I don't know if the lamp will stay put. This is in front of the stuff. Oops, I blocked out my light source. Anyway, in front of the light fixture there, there's a hole that's not showing up. It's like a gray area. It's like a lighter gray patch in that scene. But that's what I have to deal with living here. Is you know we, I've had assholes living above me for uh, like five years, and they turned my ceiling into that just by overflowing water and stuff. And um, one guy actually destroyed the toilet. I told that story on here. He, um, you know how people say. Uh, Man, you destroyed my toilet. When they mean they clogged it up, this guy actually clogged up the toilet and plunged it so hard that he literally destroyed the toilet and blew out the seal. And then a whole, I'm sorry for the pun, shitload of water come through the ceiling through that uh, open panel there. Now you may ask why I don't get on my landlord to repair things. It's hard enough to get my landlord to do basic stuff like make sure I don't have scumbags living here. And plus... One thing I will say for the dude, he does not raise my rent. I've been renting here for a long time off of him, and it's affordable. So I don't want to give him any excuse to start raising the rent. But yeah, I probably am going to have to do something about that ceiling. Just because it's got that open panel there and, you know, water uh, pours through it. And um, the, the uh, hanging ceiling, because that's what it is, is um, when the water comes through the wood, floor from upstairs and hits the hanging ceiling a lot of times it's sturdy enough to hold water up there and it'll evaporate I actually put that hole in the ceiling myself because water was dripping up there and I, you know not being the uh, shiniest penny in the drawer I uh, took a broom and I tried to like poke up through the ceiling to see if I could see pipes dripping or see what was going on and the uh, paneling was soft from being saturated and I just poked the broom straight up through the paneling <laughs> so that's kind of my fault it's not my fault that you know the people were over on the water upstairs but yeah this is you know if somebody asked me in the comments on my last video why I don't move and it's like well you know people are the same everywhere you know maybe I could get a better more stringent landlord that's a possibility but you don't know what you're moving into and I like the uh, neighborhood I like the fact that I'm really close to family um, living here ideally I would like to rent a house and then I wouldn't have to worry about you know living with um, bad tenants but uh, if I did that I wouldn't have very much leftover money at all uh, to live on so you know rent an apartment for what I pay I might as well tell you what I pay is a uh, uh, 425 a month everything paid except for electric and it's a little run down right now but this place isn't that all that bad I got a big I'm claustrophobic so I got a big uh, spacious um, main room and then I got a kitchen area and uh, it's got all kind of counter good counter space and tons of cupboards and all that you know so it's set up pretty good for uh, one uh, one uh, lonely old person living by themselves so you know it's like uh, you just get people that were civilized I don't mind living here living you know wherever you go there you are so living here living somewhere else what difference does it make except for the fact that the landlord just is not good at screening people so you know this is what I know about the new people so far that have only been in here for um four or five days they immediately overflowed water and I had water coming through my ceiling which uh, put really uh, put me in a fit of despair on a Sunday night so I called somebody you know I couldn't think anybody to call because I was in despair and that's of course why I talk on here is because I don't got a lot of like uh, good support people and uh, you know I don't blame them for that because they got their own issues and stuff mostly I don't blame them for that but uh, so I call somebody and you know in my inner circle and I'm talking to them and I'm like yeah it really sucks the uh, squatters are still here and now I got new people raining water through me through the ceiling and he's he almost immediately says uh, so you don't have anybody living above you now I just start laughing I'm like and he's like, I'm sorry. I was like, I'm tired or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know. You 
clearly weren't listening at all, you know, let alone tuned into the fact that I'm like in despair because uh, of my situation, which is, uh, you know, having the uh, benzo problem, having severe physical problems, and then being just having squatters living in the building with me that are threatening my life, and basically pretty high stress stuff to the point where I'm just putting off everything and uh, just trying to get through the day. You know, I already popped the volume. I bought some volume and I already popped, some, popped the volume before I did this video. It hasn't kicked in yet, but, you know, I woke up in a real, uh, such a high stress mood and there's three things, like I was starting to say, but I, you know me, I digress too much. Three things I know about the, the new people. They uh, immediately overflowed water and uh, dripped through my ceiling. The woman walks like she's in Jurassic Park. I mean, I can't tell her not to be fat. You can't tell somebody to stop being so fat. So, you know, maybe she can't help it. But I'm serious, man. There's like stomping around and there's stomping around where you're, you're expecting to see your water glass with the concentral circles in it. You know, I'm talking about vibrations. You know, that's... Uh, I was listening to that this morning and I'm like, Ugh. you know, so... Um volume it was volume in this video to help me like try to maintain and not freak out i'm like i don't even want to talk to my landlord about it you know this is people that are new maybe she's moving in and moving stuff around and maybe she won't walk around so much and uh you know make make it uh earthquake tremors down here but good lord i mean i, I can't listen to that. i can't listen to that every day and then Another thing that I know about him is the first time that I met her, she knocked on the door a couple of days ago. She's immediately asking me for my Wi-Fi password, which I don't know, you know, I'm obviously not part of today's culture or whatever, but I don't know the etiquette behind that. But when I meet somebody that I'm going to be living in the building with for the first time, I don't ask them for anything, let alone passwords. I mean, why would I, why would I give you a stranger on um, my Wi-Fi password so you can piggyback on my Wi-Fi you know and then it's just for a day I mean I don't know the etiquette of that or maybe I could have like said give me your device and programmed it in and then they wouldn't know because I'm not a techie guy so I don't know but I just said no I said no I don't do that it's not you personally I just I don't do that I had bad experiences with that which it was kind of a lie but um, an expedient one and uh, so that's what I know walks like an elephant, has no compunction about asking me for my private information the first time she meets me, and puts water through my ceiling, and they've been here five days. So, you know, I was hoping to get a break. I was hoping, actually, that when the squatters got kicked out, that I would just have peace and quiet for a couple of weeks, because he said these people weren't going to move in for like three weeks. So that's what I was hoping for. But now I'm seriously starting to think that, you know, I got to just live somewhere else like the guy in the comments said you know it's just it's been five years of bad tenants here I can run through the list real quick for you uh, interracial couple where the guy was racist against white people and had a white girlfriend and they had loud fights constantly I've had crack dealers crack dealing lesbians specifically and uh, I had to call the police on for domestic violence I've had pot dealers it's, and I've had um, hood people, which were just loud and uncivilized, which weren't necessarily bad people. They were just didn't know how to behave themselves in a civilized manner and were high and drunk a lot of the time. And then the meth situation, which, of course, is what's got me in the state I'm in now and the death threats and everything. So, you know, it's almost like this place has so many bad memories for me that, you know, I'd move just on that basis, but I don't move expecting things to be any better with because you're going to run into bad people everywhere. There's the world's full of bad people. You could say, well, you could always get lucky and move into a situation where, you know, you like the people that you're living in the building with, or you could move into a standard apartment building where they uh, soundproof everything more because I lived in one of those places, and unless they played music super loud, you didn't really hear anything inside when you were inside your house. You still had to deal with them outside and and stuff like that and here's a funny digression for you is uh when i was living there 
it was supposed to be a temporary arrangement, but it went on longer than it should have. But um, my niece was getting back from the army, and she didn't know anything about civilian life. So she knew I had like a bad situation where I was living. She's like, well, let's, you know, get an apartment together and I can get used to uh, living in the real world and not getting worried about being bombed by Afghanistan uh, militants and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, we can work out some situation where maybe we rent out a duplex and you live in one side and I live in the other side and then I can help you out, you know. I was like, oh, that sounds reasonable, but then we had this apartment and um, it was, it had enough room in it for us and stuff, but it's, we still just was, saw each other too much. But anyways, the point to that whole story is, is uh, uh, you still have to deal with assholes wherever you go. So there was a guy that would park right in front. He lived like four apartments down, but he would park like right in front of our house with his big ass truck and take up two parking spaces. And then my niece would have to park over by his place and it didn't make no damn sense you know and she's uh military so you know she's confrontational so she leaves a note on the guy's door and or not on the guy's door but on the uh, hood of his car and uh it says something kind of inflammatory about like uh you don't have to be such a jerk and uh, take up this my parking space why don't you park closer to your own damn apartment? You know, something along those lines, which stated the facts, but not in a pleasant sort of manner. So the guy comes out, and he's got like a scraper to, it's in the winter time, to uh, scrape uh, his windows. And he reads this note, and she even put our apartment number on it. So, you know, he saw her before. She's five foot tall, like 120 pounds. And, uh, so he's all like pissed off he knocks on the door expecting to see her and my six foot one 185 pound ass comes to the door and says what do you want and i look and he's holding that uh window scraper in his hand and he sees me looking at it and he actually like slowly put it behind his back and flipped it like you don't see this this is not a weapon i'm not here to fight you sir and like flipped it in the snow and i'm like I thought that was funny as hell, you know, and he stammered some things I don't remember, and then he left. And then I talked to uh, my niece, and I was like, there's a guy here, and he was acting really weird, and I don't even know what the hell it was about. And she goes, oh, that's probably that guy that I put the note on his uh, windshield. I'm like, oh, that explains it. He came to the door expecting to confront a little tiny woman, and he got a big, huge dude. <laughs> so he wasn't expecting that shit, so... He, he left his uh, windshield wiper scraper in, in a hole in the snow. And I showed my niece and I said, see that hole in the snow over there? And she went over and picked out his windshield wiper from the snow. And uh, he was like, I don't have no weapon. I don't want no fight. You know, and flipped it in the snow. That shit was funny. Um, but anyways, you know, that apartment there had soundproofing and was built to be apartment. So you, you wouldn't hear this, you know, Jurassic Park stomping uh, T-Rex impact vibrations that I'm hearing. Uh, today, which is uh, getting on my nerves, which are already fried severely, you know, and, um, yeah, so, my luck continues to hold true, now, they might settle down, they might be reasonable neighbors, there might even be people I can talk to and be like, you know, look, and people don't like, of course, anybody having, taken an authoritative tone with them, or just, like, pointing out things that they're doing that might not be good, and it didn't work when I had the hood people here, and these people seem hoodish to me. Color don't matter as far as hood people, you know, white, black, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a culture that you're raised in that uh, makes hood people or people that are, you know, somewhat ill-mannered Ill and not particularly interested in following societal conventions as far as politeness. So... Uh, they might be people that I can reason with. I don't know. All I know is my nerves are stretched to the brink, and I'm hearing a brontosaurus walking up and down upstairs, and like all fucking morning. And I, yeesh. so, um, I try my best to be optimistic, and I try to like um, work through my uh, uh, bad feelings I have about life and about things in general. And I do have horrendous luck. 
Nobody questions that. Nobody that knows my whole story questions that. I had horrible luck, you know. Even, like, falling into the Xanax thing was, like, it just happened, so happened that I had a sympathetic uh, uh, relative that didn't know what Xanax was, and I told her I was having trouble sleeping, and she said, well, I have these pills that might help you sleep. Even that, I kind of had bad luck on, you know, because that was partly my stupidity, but it was also bad luck that I have to know somebody that was uh, being put on Xanax that had extra Xanax, because, you know, usually they don't give you extra. So they just started giving me extra Xanax, and that's how I got physically dependent on that stuff. So even that was bad luck. So I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm the universe's bitch, basically. That's what I feel like. I feel like after a while you just expect things to go bad or you expect trouble or you expect problems. And then, you know, um, my family, you know, they're not, they're not all that bad. I mean, they're just not emotional support people. You know, there are people that, like I said, that I was complaining about the people upstairs to somebody, and that's pretty basic X's and O's, like either or type information. It's not a complicated story like what I'm telling you all now. It's basically either people live up there or they don't live up there. So I'm saying, complain about the people living up there, and he's like, so nobody lives up there now? You know, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. He's a sweetheart of a guy otherwise. But, you know, there's people that, um, just because of the way that they were raised or their situation that just they're not really good at being empathetic that's just the way it is um like does this other dude that's you know family he shows up at my door yesterday and he owes me 50 bucks now we've had fights about money before about the specific sum 50 bucks we had a hell of a fight which i yelled so loud that I actually lost my voice. That's never happened to me before. And I threw my phone across the room and cracked it. You know, I totally lost my shit. I mean, I was just pissed off because he thought that, you know, all I cared about was the money. And I really cared about, like, you disrespecting me and not letting me know what, what the hell was going on about when I was actually supposed to get paid and stuff. You know, but loaning money is always dicey and stuff. But we had that history of fighting over 50 bucks. So he shows up at the door. And he's like, here's the 30 bucks I owe you. And I'm like, dude, it's not 30 bucks. You know, and I had that uh-oh sensation. of like, uh-oh, here we go again with another fight about money. When I'm just trying to help him out. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, man. Here, here's the other 20. And he's just, he's just, I was like, that's not funny, man. I was like, why would you think that was funny or appropriate to do to give me that sensation of, uh-oh, you know, since we actually fought about that exact sum, and he's like playing a joke, like, here's the 30 bucks I owe you. And he's like, well, you can't blame me for trying to get away with paying 30 instead of 20, or 30 instead of 50. I'm like, oh, yes, I can blame you. So, um, yeah, hopefully, I don't know, hopefully, like, my nerves will moderate, you know, and I won't have to, uh, uh, rely on, I'm trying to, Xanax, I think, is what's messing with my stomach, is, like, my increased dosage of that, and I felt better when I was taking less of it, but also I was psychologically better, because that was before all the, uh, meth nonsense started, and before I had open warfare with people living here and all that, so, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to tell, if the anxiety is because of the physical symptoms or if the physical symptoms are because of the anxiety or like if the medication that you're taking it's kind of hard to sort all that out like if it's the medication that's making you sicker you know but I don't I wake up every day just feeling awful I know that and um, that's not uncommon with people that have a, a physical history of um, surgeries and whatnot like I do and some and when you get older you get the aches and pains. Unfortunately, you know, I my uh, friend the cop takes exquisite care of himself, and he's six. He just turned sixty-five a few days ago, and uh, you know, he uh, has aches and pains. And the dude, as far as I know, had a brief bout of smoking in his twenties, which he quit in his twenties, and takes real good care of himself. He even drinks like uh, vinegar with the mother in it which is, you have to look that up, uh, but it's supposed to be, like, excellent for joint, joint health, and, you know, he's real health conscious, and, um, he was actually 
embarrassing his police force that he worked for because even into his 50s he was uh, uh, beating 20 year olds 20 year old cops in their cop Olympics you know that's the kind of physical shape he was in but he still ends up with aches and pains so anyway point being to that is like some of my problem um, might be just due to being a little bit older and uh, having a bad physical history um, yeah I don't know my appetite's been bad lately I got a bunch of food in here now um, but my appetite's been bad and body's not working like it should and uh, yeah, not getting outside enough and stuff so I'm really not uh, taking care of myself it's kind of weird like maybe if I suffer and take care of myself better then maybe I have to suffer through a period of time and then I can get to feel better but that takes like faith and hope that you know you can like even though you feel like you're dying you can like lift weights and walk on a treadmill and go outside and visit with people and you know sort of fake it till you make it that's really hard though um, to do if you feel like death and all you want to do is lay around to uh, fight against that and um, you know get your exercise and make sure you're getting your sleep and your you know all that stuff's hard like last night um, I took a, a full half a milligram of Xanax because I wanted to make sure I went to sleep it didn't even fucking work so you know that that pissed me off I didn't go to sleep until uh, between 3 and 4 in the morning and, um, yeah, so that was a bummer. But, anyways, the point of me doing these videos is not to depress y'all or to make you look at my sorry mug or hear my raspy, raspy voice. The point is that, you know, for me, this is a way of me to keep fighting through um, the emotional difficulty of my situation. Now, whether or not that helps anybody else but me, I don't know. You know, I don't... You know, I got three nags on my, la my uh, last one, so... Uh, maybe I shouldn't have put anything in the title but Benzo Update. I put Chemical Warfare because I thought that was funny. Because, you know, I'm battling a chemical warfare with the uh, physical dependence on the Benzos. And I also had a chemical warfare part in there where I had like a product called liquid ass that stinks to high heaven that I was thinking about using against the squatters to make their apartment uninhabitable that would be chemical warfare so you know that was self indulgent on my part but sometimes if you put stuff like that in a title you just attract um, viewers that don't know what they're in for so they click on it and then they you know they're like this is not what I bargained for this is false advertising and then they give you the neg or maybe I was just boring or being an asshole in the last one. I don't know. I don't really think about that too much. Uh, positives and negatives. Um, you know, this is my therapy. This is like you sitting in, a, in a, on a therapy session with someone. Or, you know, like being a fly on the wall. Except for I'm talking to the fly. You know. It's like, um, I'm kind of like you're my psychiatrist right now. Or like a... Ernest Hemingway said about writing that his typewriter was his psychiatrist, which, you know, I assume meant that by working out things on the page, like emotions and stuff, that, that through words, that uh, it had a psychiatric uh, therapeutic value, which is, this is what this has for me. Um, and plus, I love articulation and I love words. I don't like looking at myself, but I, I have to just think that, you know, I'm looking at you, a uh, faceless, nameless stranger. <laughs> so, um, that's the way I have to think of it, and I have to, like, tune out the fact that, you know, most people, I think, don't really care to look at themselves for an extended period of time, especially when you get a little older, you know, um, and uh, I understand, uh, but, you know, it, it's difficult that's like one of the hardest parts of me making these is like uh, looking at the camera and looking at myself and um, you know <laughs> believe me 
That's, the ego part for me is not looking at myself. The ego part is making the words and being articulate and trying to be funny and clever and telling stories and, you know, having the nerve and the goddamn audacity to think that I can be entertaining for a half an hour because we're right about at the half an hour mark. But what you get with me is honesty and uh, my true feelings about things. At least the things I talk about. I mean, I keep some of the horror of my medical condition to myself just because it's nasty and unpleasant. I mean, I can't, you know, I've described that before as the reason why the shirt's up here is because of the hypersensitivity and my symptoms have been very bad because stress feeds into the disease and makes it worse. So, um, you know, otherwise, you know, it's like I tell, you know, people it's like believe me I am not proud of this body I just don't if you knock on my door and I'm not wearing a shirt it's not because I think I'm Mr. Atlas or uh, you know I'm not a GQ <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not showing off my, my muscles or nothing like that that I don't have it's just a matter of comfort if I know you're coming I will uh, wrap a bandage around my hypersensitive skin and I'll wear a shirt nine times out of ten but if you pop in, you get what you get. And uh, anyways. So yeah, I don't really feel the volume yet. Um, it's quieter upstairs. I don't hear anybody stomping around. But uh, I'm in no condition to move. I mean, this place is a sty. I really need to pay, uh, pay somebody to come in here and uh, clean it. Because I don't think I'm up to the task. And... Uh, I guess I could just, you know, be that kind of person and be vindictive if I do leave here and just leave this place trashed for the landlord to deal with because he kind of deserves it. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a weird thing because he's a nice guy and I like him, but he's just not really good at being a landlord. Um, he just let, you know, like, okay, there's another thing I didn't bring up was um, the new people up here. Uh, when I was texting him on Sunday night with the water coming through the ceiling, I asked him, you know, this person employed, do they have a job? And he's like, I don't know. And I'm thinking, man, if you want to get like a large sum of money out of somebody's wallet every month, you need to know that shit. You need to know if they got a job or what their source of income is. When I moved in here, they wanted to, they made sure that I was on a disability and that they checked my source of income. So maybe he's protecting their confidentiality or something like that, but I don't see no car out there. And, uh, and she's been here during the day for um, probably three, three out of the four days during the week, so she probably don't work. She's a little bit older than me. Um, so that's not good, because if I have to listen to her walking around all the time, and shaking my windows. Like I said, you can't tell somebody to stop being so fat. I mean, Jackie Gleason was laid on its feet, I heard, though. So, you know, I've been lucky in that regard. I've never really had a serious weight problem. So, I, you know, I don't mean to sound unsympathetic to that situation. I I go the other way where, um, you know, at one time I was um, six foot one, 148 pounds. So I go the other way where I got the other kind of weight problem. Now I go about 172 or 173, and my normal weight is like 185, but I haven't been doing too good, so my weight is really not where it should be. Um, okay, I don't know if I'm being born yet or not, if I can think of anything else to talk about, but yeah, that's the main things I want to talk about, is I have a set-out date to get rid of the squatters, on the uh, 31st, which is only eight days away, as far as uh, the new neighbors, all signs appear to be toward the negative so far. And they live directly over top of me, whereas the squatters live off to the side a little bit. And um, as far as my benzo thing, um, I'm at a half milligram a day, which is actually what I'm getting prescribed and um, I was doing much better in June and July and August and not been good and uh, 
I bought some of my volume to uh, help me take West Xanax and to uh, at least get me to the point where I don't have people in the building that have threatened to kill me. At least to get me through these eight days, I bought enough to get me through um, those eight days. And I, uh, staying medicated like that is not an answer to your problems. I understand this. But at the same time, I don't really know what I can do about my problems. It's up to the law to get them people out of here. It's like I'm just, like I said, that's one of the problems with the uh, situation. Why it's so stressful is the impotence and pass and the uh, passivity you have to have because I can't go outside the law. I did everything within the law that I could do. I called the cops three different occasions. You know, I I went outside the law, which the law knows about, with the machete incident. You know, just to let, just to let them know that you know they can't have a free pass and act any way they want here, and that they have somebody that's going to stand up to them and oppose them. You know, and then I backed that up. That machete incident was on a Thursday, and I backed it up with a noise complaint immediately the next night on a Friday, and then on Sunday is when I accidentally locked them out and they were breaking in, and then um, that's when. They, the cops were still here and they were still jawing at me and calling me a, a goddamn motherfucker and shit while the cops were here so I you know very slyly waved the cops in uh, sneakily and they come back inside the building and heard her going off and that's when I that ticked that one uh, scary cop off and that's when he threatened them and then ever since then they've been afraid and so they've been they haven't really been acting a mess except for like the peripheral people that come here they don't that don't know what's up but the main people are scared and so you know they know that if I call that guy that that guy's gonna come back and the guy threatened him and he means business and he's a sergeant which I don't know how cop rank works but I mean he was the senior officer there and he weighs about 240 and just a scary dude so you know after that I, I was gonna my plan which the landlord of course didn't go along with is to play that kind of hardball with him to you know, and I told her that day, I said, honey, we're just getting started, my exact words. It's only going to get worse from here. And then she said some more stuff, and I said, I'm just trying to do what's best for both of us, and that's to get you to leave. That's all I said to her is, honey, we're just getting started. It's only going to get worse from here, and then I'm just doing, trying to do what's best for both of us, and that's to get you to leave. And uh, so I figured I'd take that route, you know, where I'm, I'm just going to let them know they're not going to have a free ride here. It's not going to be fun. And then the landlord was supposed to go along with me on the bribe. And they were like, well, we can stay here and this guy is just going to be an asshole the whole time and give us hell. Plus, we got to worry about the guy because he seems crazy. He's bringing machetes into the hallway and stuff. Um, or we can take money and have free money and get out of here, you know. That was the plan, you know, the, the what they call it, the stick in one hand and the velvet glove in the other, or something like that, you know, the the carrot or the stick, you know, the carrot would be the money and the stick would be the machete. But the landlord did not go along with the program. This was supposed to end at the uh, beginning of the month. This was, yeah, that was um, July 26 with the machete, so it was supposed the plan that I had it was supposed to end and not go on through it for a whole nother month through August because I was already stressed out to the brink you know at the end of July so at, you know my meticulous thorough nature which I, it is what it is I know it probably can get annoying at times um, I have to cover all these details and it is kind of a complicated thing you know the way things worked out and the way to deal with it but since it, it worked out like that where the landlord did not help me get them out of here with a bribe which made perfect sense to me and if you think about it you know from their point of view they get free housing for another month and they can't rent nowhere for 200 bucks because it costs 200 bucks or maybe 225 bucks for him to get to um, um, file the eviction papers and to hire the bailiff it costs, he said it costs right around 200 bucks, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. So I, I said, let me pay the 200 bucks. You just give it to him. Because post machete negotiations are tricky.
It's not like I can go up to them and they won't be on edge after they see me with a machete swinging it at them and banging it into the wall. So, anyways, the point, main point being is that this cop scared the shit out of them. So I was like, well, the landlord's not helped me get them, get them out. But that's cop scared them so bad that they're quiet, you know. But it's still stressful having them here and having that hostility in the building and knowing you got mortal enemies, you know. Mortal, mortal enemies you're sleeping literally 30 to 40 feet from every night that can cause you some uh, stress and some little trouble going to sleep and you know I don't know if I, I, I imagine I'll break out of that pattern but now a days because I've lived like this for like three months when I wake up there's no going back to sleep once I'm awake I'm awake it doesn't matter what time of day it is it's not like I can wake up and be like okay I'm waking up and I'm thinking about that stuff instantly and I'm on edge, you know. I'm thinking like, I just can't go back to sleep. Like, once I'm awake, it's no matter what I feel or no matter how much sleep I had, I'm up. So, you know, it, it might take me a while to get back to normal. So anyways, um, what can I do one day at a time and um, try to have as good a days as I can have? and uh try you know i i miss the person i was and i think about the person i was before uh what, what did i call it that very unhappy unlucky accident where i complained about not sleeping well and i happened to know somebody that had extra xanax that was trying to help me but i ended up getting me hooked on uh, xanax which they apologized for several times i'm like you didn't know even what you were taking the doctor did not inform you of how dangerous and how addictive the substance you were taking was. So I don't. I just make a point of telling them every time that I don't blame you for that. That's just the way that worked out. You know, yeah, it's been a living hell and it's really uh, made me into a different person. I think about the person that I was before I took the benzo stuff and like, you know, I could maybe even laugh about um, the Jurassic Park noises coming from upstairs. I could maybe even laugh about that, you know, or just think it's funny. And like, I was always very patient with um, family members and their quirky ways, like the $30 instead of $50 thing, or the guy not listening to me on the phone or any of that stuff, man, I would just like blow it off and think it's funny, you know, I, because my nerves were okay. And I, I didn't have uh, that chemical dependence that was putting you on edge because the thing that they don't tell you about uh, benzos is I don't I'm forgetting the word but I think it's like counterproductive oh, counterintuitive I don't know what the word is but the point to the word that I'm trying to think of is is that you take them for a symptom that they end up making worse so you take Xanax for anxiety and it works in the short term but in the long term the long term might only be at might be as short as two or three weeks it makes things worse and I know this you know I know this but I'm on such edge that I you know I'm sort of skirting that slippery slope of taking too much and I know I, I backslid but I, I felt like I didn't have a choice uh, it's just been you know a r real bad summer and I've had some uh, bad times in my life but this this is up there this is up there I've never really lived in a building where uh, besides my father, which I, I never really felt safe around him because he was uh, not quite right in the head and had violent tendencies. But, you know, just to flesh that out a little bit, he didn't really uh, beat on you so much. It's just like you knew he was a dangerous, dangerous person. You know, it was the threat of violence that was in the air all the time. But, you know, I've never really, besides my upbringing, I've never really lived with the threat of constant violence and then having to worry about myself and, the, and like losing my temper and getting thrown in jail and stuff I didn't have to worry about that when I was growing up because I was a different person then but you know now you know I'm out there swinging machetes and stuff so I got to worry about my own temper which I can't even back up because my body's a wreck but I have to worry about my own irrational crazy temper which doesn't care that my body's a wreck it just wants a fight you know, so I got to worry about my temper and I got to worry about people jumping me. And, you know, like I said, I even had that one incident, which was funny, where uh, 
I just woke up in the morning. It's uh, six thirty in the morning. I put my it's a Sunday morning. I put my coffee down. I didn't even get to drink it yet. I opened the window because it's stuffy in my house, and the guy comes walking outside, looks in the window in my direction, and says, "If I were you, I'd change my motherfucking last name." And I'm like, I didn't even respond. I was like, like he just kept walking and stuff. But I'm like thinking about it. And I'm like, you already know where I live. <laughs> if you want to do something to me. I'm not on the lam. You don't need my name or my social security number to track me down. <laughs> so it was kind of a funny threat, but it was, you know, some guy that was up all night. And I think he was trying to score meth upstairs. But uh, the meth trading, I don't think it's going on here anymore. At least from what I can tell, it's not going on here anymore. It's just squatters. So... You know, he stopped by like three times that day, and I've never seen the dude before or since, and he's telling me through the window it's some strange guy, uh, you know, that I need to change my motherfucking last name. <laughs> so, I'm like, I'm like what, the, what the hell? I didn't even get to drink my coffee yet. I'm being threatened, like, before I get to drink my coffee in the morning. It's not even 7 o'clock in the morning. It's, I'm actually being threatened before I'm awake. You know, but that's, that's the kind of thing I've been living with. So, anyways, that's 45 minutes, you know. Um, uh, like I said, I know I'm long-winded, and I know I can be tedious, I know I'm way too thorough with the storytelling and too meticulous about detail. So for all these faults that I have, I, I must beg your indulgence. And uh, like I said, this is like you sitting in on a therapy session, and it's helpful to me. I cannot say if it's helpful to the people that watch my videos or not. I, I recently had a very nice compliment where somebody said that I did help them, which made me feel very good. Uh, you know, sometimes it's helpful to know that there's other people out there that are uh, struggling and um, are still good people and still trying to do the right thing emotionally. And that's like the right thing to do emotionally is better out than in is to ex express it some way. If you can sing, sing. If you can play guitar, play guitar, which I haven't done lately because my nerves have been too fried, which I miss. If you can write, write. If you can talk, talk. And you can say what you want to about me, but I can talk a blue streak, and that's a mortal certainty. So, I don't know if that's a skill or a talent or a curse or even a burden to those that are forced to listen, but it is what I do. So, anyways, uh... Thank you for listening, and, and uh, hey, uh, I guess all I can say is until next time, and uh, I did have things to report this time, like I do have a day to look forward to, because this has been like being in prison without knowing the sentence. You know, when you're in prison, you can be like, circle a date on the calendar and say, that's my day to get out of prison. So, for me in here... I have no idea when this was going to end, if it was going to end, you know, or what was going to happen. And, you know, now I know. So I should at least feel better about that. And I do. So goodbye. And here comes the part where I put my hand in front of the screen and say adios. <laughs>